This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 34. Coming up on Space Time, Cassini's first dive inside Saturn's rings, hints of possible new physics beyond the standard model, and ripples in the cosmic web. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Cassini spacecraft has survived one of its riskiest manoeuvres after successfully undertaking its first ever dive through the narrow gap between the planet Saturn and its rings. As well as providing unrivaled close-ups of the rings, the flight through this previously unexplored region could finally help astronomers answer that nagging question of the true age of Saturn's spectacular ring system. Are the rings a relatively recent addition following a collision or breakup? Or are they a more permanent feature, constantly being renewed by fresh icy debris? Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, were keeping a close eye on events as the probe beamed the science and engineering data collected during the adventure back some 1.3 billion kilometres to the dishes of NASA's Deep Space Communications Network. As it dove through the gap, Cassini came within 3,000 kilometres of Saturn's cloud tops and within about 300 kilometres of the innermost visible edge of Saturn's rings. While mission managers were confident that Cassini would pass through the gap successfully, they nevertheless took extra precautions during the first dive as the region had never previously been explored. In fact, no spacecraft has ever come so close to Saturn before. Scientists could only rely on predictions based on their experience with Saturn's other rings of what they thought the gap between the rings would be like. The gap between the rings and the top of Saturn's atmosphere is only 2,400 kilometres wide. The best models for the region suggest that if there were ring particles in the area where Cassini crossed the ring plane, they'd be tiny, as fine as smoke. But because the spacecraft was flying through the region at around 124,000 km per hour relative to the planet, even small particles hitting a sensitive area could potentially have disabled the ship. So as a protective measure, mission managers positioned Cassini's 4-metre wide dish-shaped high-gain antenna as a shield, orienting it in the direction of oncoming ring particles. But the manoeuvre meant the spacecraft was out of contact with Earth during the actual ring plane crossing. So Cassini was programmed to collect science data while close to the planet and then turn towards Earth to make contact about 20 hours after the crossing. Cassini's first dive through the gap was then followed by a second just a few days later. Following its last close flyby of the moon Titan in late April, Cassini began what mission managers are calling its grand finale. During this final chapter, Cassini will loop Saturn approximately once a week, making a total of 22 dives between the rings and the planet. Data from these first dives are helping engineers understand if and how they'll need to protect the spacecraft on its future ring plane crossings. The spacecraft is now on a 142-day death spiral inside Saturn's rings, which will eventually result in a suicide plunge into Saturn's atmosphere and consequently an end to the Cassini mission on September 15, 2017. While NASA has extended Cassini's mission three times in the past, scientists are now concerned that the spacecraft is running low on propellant, and that means the probe could accidentally crash onto one of Saturn's moons. The problem with that is if there is life on Saturn's moons, Cassini could end up contaminating it with microorganisms from Earth which had stowed away on the spacecraft. NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra will provide the primary dishes for Cassini's end-of-mission death plunge, hearing the last words from the spacecraft before it's burned up and crushed in Saturn's thick, swirling atmosphere. Cassini was launched on a Titan Centaur rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida in 1997, arriving at Saturn seven years later in 2004. During its 20-year-long journey, Cassini has revealed the Saturnian system as a world more mysterious and spectacular than scientists could ever have hoped. From an incredible and unexpected hexagonal-shaped storm raging at Saturn's North Pole, to the breathtaking beauty of its intricate rings sculpted by shepherding moons, Cassini has surpassed all expectations with its incredible scientific discoveries. Cassini was also the mothership for the Huygens landing probe, which achieved an historic first-ever touchdown on Saturn's then-mysterious moon Titan in 2005. In the process, Huygens revealed Titan to be a world, at least in appearance, very similar to the Earth, a world of lakes and rivers fed by rains, which have also sculpted the landscape. However, unlike Earth, the rains on Titan aren't water, but liquid methane and ethane. 
Cassini also discovered a global subsurface liquid water ocean beneath the frozen crust of the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus. Plumes of water and minerals, including organic chemistry essential for life as we know it, were detected by Cassini erupting into space from geysers at the moon's so-called South Pole tiger stripes, indications of possible hydrothermal vent activity on the Enceladian ocean floor. Similar seafloor vents on Earth's mid-ocean ridges provide a rich chemical soup feeding unique ecosystems of life completely independent of the planet's surface. Scientists believe this may well be where life on Earth began, and that raises questions about what lies in the oceans beneath the frozen and Celadian surface. Glenn Nagel, from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra, says Cassini's discoveries have been breathtaking. I think Cassini has given us a, a few things. One, it's certainly given us, given us incredible insights into a world like Saturn, this you know, world that has this amazing ring structure around it, and the family of more than 60 moons. It, it literally is like a miniature version of our entire solar system. So in a, in a sort of a gigantic microcosm in a way, it's really helped scientists to learn a lot more about the rest of our part of space. I think personally, the most amazing discoveries have really been, well, not so much the planet, which is amazing in itself, all the rings, but actually the moons itself. The moons have turned out to be incredible worlds, all with all sorts of different features and surface compositions. But those couple of tantalizing worlds there, like Titan and Enceladus, and actually have the possibilities to support life. And whoever imagined that when they first left the Earth 20 years ago? It's all very reminiscent of both the Voyager probes mission back in the 70s when they launched, and also so uh, Galileo back in the 1990s when it began studying the Jovian system. Again, the planets were spectacular, but it was the discoveries on the moons, these separate individual and quite unique worlds which really opened scientists' eyes and just left everyone a gob. Yeah, every time we go somewhere new, it's always those things that we didn't imagine that turn out to be some of the most fascinating things. To look for ice geysers on the you know, moon Enceladus out at Saturn or at Jupiter with the erupting volcanoes, the first discovered beyond Earth on the surface of Io orbiting around that giant world. So these are amazing places and all give insights into the earliest periods in Earth's history. So not just learning about what's out there, but learning a lot more about back home. Well, yeah, in the case of Titan, scientists think that's what the early Earth may have been like in primordial times, a very similar sort of environment. And of course, with Titan, it's the only place we know of in the solar system which has rivers and lakes and oceans on the surface, just like the Earth. Yeah, so uh, a liquid on its surface, but not water in a liquid form. In fact, it's so cold out there that water is frozen as ice, as solid as rock. Yeah, it's the bedrock. What's raining, yeah. yeah, what's raining from Titan's atmosphere are things like liquid ethane and methane, literally organic chemistry, some of the building blocks of life, raining down to the surface, carving through this hard as rock ice, creating these rivers and tributaries and forming massive lakes, literally seas, on the surface of Titan. And it's wonderful some of the projects that we've been involved in here at the tracking station in Canberra, not only getting back images from Cassini, but having signals from the Cassini spacecraft actually bounced off the surface of those lakes, received back here on Earth, one and a half billion kilometres away, so that the scientists can measure the depths of those lakes and the size and the changes in the surface even to the point of ripples and waves. Yeah, and seasonal changes too it would seem. Yeah, it seems to be that there are ebbs and flows in tides and heavy rainstorms of this liquid ethane methane and uh, creating whole new lakes and tributaries and a mysterious island perhaps that sort of appears and disappears as the tide comes in and out. What happens in the next few months until the mission finally closes? So we've had already two successful encounters flying down through the gap between Saturn's rings and the actual planet's cloud tops itself. And so there are another 20 of these orbits, all culminating with a final plunge in on the 15th of September. And at about 10 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on September 15th, uh, our tracking station will be handling the very last signals from the spacecraft as it plummets finally into the atmosphere of Saturn, literally disintegrating, becoming a, a shooting star in the atmosphere of a giant ringed world, which for a spacecraft I think is probably the most poetic way to go. But good old Cassini, 20 years, returning information, spectacular stuff in the last 13 years while it's been at Saturn, will be literally transmitting right up to its last moment, its last breath of data coming back to Earth and we'll be receiving it right here. 
Now, of course, this isn't the first time NASA's done this. It's done this twice previously, both times involving the uh, the Galileo probe, once for the Galileo atmosphere mission to uh, Jupiter, which was a little probe launched by Galileo prior to its arrival at the Jovian system, and then for Galileo itself. And like with Cassini, the, the Galileo mission end was designed so that the probe wouldn't smash into somewhere like Europa, which could have life beneath its surface and its giant subsurface oceans. And that's the same reason that Cassini's doing what it's going to do, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, that's right. And also NASA's Juno spacecraft will also have an end that Jupiter by plunging the atmosphere. The reason for this is part of the mandated planetary protection laws. We really do want to protect the environments of space and those worlds that have the potential to maybe have some form of life or have the potential to have that life in the future. Some spacecraft, certainly ones we've sent out into deep space where we can't use solar power, they use radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTGs. These are little decaying bits of plutonium from which we generate heat from heat we get power and certainly with the spacecraft and those power sources we don't want those contaminating those potential life supporting worlds. That's Glenn Nagel from the CSIRO NASA Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra. This is Space Time I'm Stuart Gary. Researchers say they may have discovered the first possible hints of new physics, which could forge the first significant cracks in the standard model of particle physics that forms the foundations of science's understanding of the universe. The new findings from CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, could be an early indicator of an inconsistency which could take science far beyond the standard model. The standard model of particle physics consists of 17 known particles and forces which combine in multitudes of ways to make up everything in the universe. The problem is, astronomers have discovered that everything we know in the universe really only makes up about 4% of everything there is in the universe. The remaining 96% is composed of two mysterious phenomena which scientists have named dark energy and dark matter. The dark doesn't refer to their properties, it simply means scientists have absolutely no idea what they really are. Dark energy is a mysterious force which is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. While dark matter is an equally mysterious substance which doesn't seem to interact with normal matter other than gravitationally. The standard model will remain incomplete until these phenomena can be included. OK, that's the background, so what have they actually found? Well, physicists working with the LHCB experiment on the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher, have discovered what appears to be a discrepancy in the decay patterns of specific types of hadrons. Hadrons are subatomic particles made up of elemental particles called quarks, which are held together by force particles called gluons. The hadrons are generated in the Large Hadron Collider's energetic collisions as packets of protons are fired in opposite directions around the Super Collider's 27-kilometre-long underground ring below the Franco-Swiss border. The proton packets are accelerated by radio waves and guided by powerful supercooled magnets to within 99.999% the speed of light. They're then smashed into each other at one of four detectors positioned around the ring. The standard model provides tested predictions about how particles and forces should behave in these collisions. By comparing the experimental results with the predictions of the standard model, physicists can look for discrepancies. Significant deviations could be pointed to previously undiscovered particles and forces. The new findings involve a type of hadron containing a specific type or flavour of quark known as a bottom quark, which gets transformed into another type of hadron containing a different type of quark called a strange quark. Quarks come in six types or flavours, all of which have different masses and half integer spin. Three of them, up, top and chum quarks, have two-thirds charge, while the remaining three, bottom, down and strange quarks, each have minus one-third charge. Now, according to the standard model, the decay pattern should produce either two electrons or two muons as byproducts. Electrons, and their more massive cousins, the muons, are different flavours of elemental particles known as leptons. Now, according to part of the standard model, known as lepton flavour universality, Electrons, muons and their even more massive counterparts called tau leptons are all virtually interchangeable, with only the huge extra mass of the tau affecting its role in some processes. But certainly as far as electrons and muons are concerned, the decay of hadrons containing bottom quarks into hadrons containing strange quarks should result in a 50-50 split between the generation of electrons and muons. And that's where the problem arises. 
The new LHCB results found non-universality, with only 40 muons being generated for every 60 electrons. Something very different from the standard model appears to be occurring. Now, of course, it could simply be a statistical fluke in the data which will go away with more experiments. That's happened before. But it could also mean that scientists have stumbled onto something quite new and different, such as unknown particles which discriminate against different flavours of leptons. And it's not the first time scientists have had unexpected results involving the particle decay of bottom quarks. Another experiment using the LHCb was measuring the ratios of muons and tau leptons generated by bottom quarks decaying into charm quarks. The standard model predicts the production of 25 tau leptons for every 100 muons. However, the scientists were again seeing non-universality, with more like 34 taus produced for every 100 muons. And possibly even more importantly, particle detectors in the United States and Japan were getting similar non-universality results. If confirmed, these findings could be the first footprints of a new particle. If so, the best possible candidates are likely to be either Z-gauge bosons, which would be similar to the already known Z boson, which together with a W boson carries the weak nuclear force responsible for radioactive decay in nuclear fission. However, if it exists, the Z gauge boson would be coupling predominantly with muons over electrons. On the other hand, any hypothetical new particle could also be a leptoquark, a hypothetical generic class of particles that allow leptons and quarks to interact directly, carrying information between quarks and leptons of a given generation such as colour or electroweak charges, allowing quarks and leptons to interact. Leptoquarks are important because they're embedded in hypotheses such as grand unification theories. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have made their first ever measurements of small-scale ripples in the primeval hydrogen gas which makes up the large-scale cosmic web-like structure of the universe. A report in the journal Science claims researchers used rare double quasars to measure variations in the structure of the cosmic web some 11 billion light-years away. The far-flung corners of intergalactic space are lonely places, barren of much else but a sprinkling of solitary hydrogen atoms left over from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. In these vast expanses between galaxies, this diffuse haze of hydrogen gas is arranged in a network of filamentary-like structures known as the cosmic web. It's tangled strands spanning billions of light years and accounting for the majority of atoms in the universe. Measurements of these small-scale fluctuations are interesting because they encode information about the temperature of the gas in the cosmic web just a few billion years after the Big Bang. You see, astronomers believe that matter in the universe went through phase transitions billions of years ago, which dramatically changed its temperature. Known as cosmic reionization, these transitions occurred when the collective ultraviolet glow of all the stars and quasars in the universe became sufficiently intense to strip electrons of atoms in intergalactic space. The first phase change of hydrogen in the universe is known as recombination. It occurred 379,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe cooled down sufficiently for electrons and protons to combine, forming the first atoms of neutral hydrogen. We see this moment in time today as the cosmic microwave background radiation, a temperature of just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. The universe was opaque before this recombination due to the scattering of photons off free electrons and to a lesser extent free protons. But it became increasingly transparent as more and more electrons and protons combined to form neutral hydrogen atoms. While the electrons of neutral hydrogen can absorb photons of some wavelengths by rising to an excited state, a universe full of neutral hydrogen would be relatively opaque only to those absorbed wavelengths, but transparent throughout most of the spectrum. This, therefore, becomes the era known to astronomers as the cosmic dark ages of the universe, because there were no light sources other than the gradually redshifting cosmic background microwave radiation. The second phase change occurred once matter started to condense in the early universe, forming the first stars, galaxies and black holes. 
These first stars and galaxies, as well as quasars generated by matter falling into supermassive black holes, were energetic enough to begin to reionize neutral hydrogen. As these objects formed and radiated energy between about 150 million and a billion years after the Big Bang, the universe reverted from being neutral to once again being an ionized plasma. However, by this time, matter had been diffused by the very expansion of the universe, and also the scattering interactions of photons and electrons were much less frequent than before electron-proton recombination. Thus, the universe, now full of low-density ionized hydrogen, remained transparent, as it still does today. It was this period which marked the end of the cosmic dark ages and the start of the epoch of reionization. But exactly how and when reionization occurred is still one of the biggest open questions in the field of cosmology, and these new measurements will provide important clues that will help narrate this chapter of cosmic history. Despite it being 11 billion light years away, the authors were still able to measure variations in the structure of this web on scales comparable to the size of a galaxy. The problem is, intergalactic gas is so tenuous it emits no light of its own. Instead, astronomers can study it indirectly by observing how it selectively absorbs light coming from even more distant quasars. Acting like cosmic lighthouses, quasars are bright distant beacons that allow astronomers to study intergalactic atoms residing between the location of the quasar and the Earth. Because these hyperluminous episodes only last for a tiny fraction of a galaxy's lifetime, quasars are correspondingly rare and are typically separated from each other by hundreds of millions of light years. In order to probe the cosmic web on much smaller length scales, astronomers exploited a fortuitous cosmic coincidence. They identified exceedingly rare pairs of quasars and were able to measure subtle differences in the absorption of intergalactic atoms along the two sight lines. One of the study's authors, Associate Professor Joseph Henao from the University of California, Santa Barbara, says pairs of quasars are a bit like needles in a haystack. Henao pioneered the application of algorithms from machine learning, a brand of artificial intelligence, to effectively locate quasar pairs in the massive amounts of data produced by digital imaging surveys of the night sky. In order to find them, Hanau and colleagues comb through images of billions of celestial objects, millions of times fainter than what can be seen with the unaided eye. Once identified, the quasar pairs were then observed using the giant 10-meter Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The study's lead author, Alberto Rore, says one of the biggest challenges was developing the mathematical and statistical tools to quantify the tiny differences being measured in this new kind of data. Rore developed these tools and then applied them to the quasar spectra. The authors then compared their measurements to supercomputer models, which simulate the formation of cosmic structures from the Big Bang right through to the present day. On a single laptop, these complex calculations would have required something like a thousand years to complete, but modern supercomputers allow the researchers to carry them out in just a few weeks. It's the laws of physics which provide the input for the simulations, with the output then being an artificial universe, which can then be directly compared to astronomical observations. And the new measurements taken by the authors support the well-established paradigm of how cosmic structures form. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And now it's time to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for the month of May on Skywatch. Once again, we're without the talents of Jonathan Nally, but hopefully he'll be back in the studio for our listening and dancing pleasure next month. Undoubtedly, the highlight for the month of May will be the Etta Ackwards meteor shower, which is generated as the Earth passes through the dust and debris trail left behind by Halley's Comet. Comet P1 Halley is a well-known short-period comet which visits the inner solar system every 75 to 76 years. The 15-kilometre-wide mountain of rock and ice will make its next close-up appearance in 2061. It's named in honour of the British astronomer Edmund Halley, who in 1705, after examining ancient Chinese, Babylonian and medieval European records, successfully predicted its return in 1758. Problem is, Halley died in 1742 before his prediction could be confirmed. When the comet did arrive exactly on time as he predicted, it was named in his honour. Comet Halley's highly elliptical and elongated orbit takes it from between the orbits of Mercury and Venus out to almost as far as the orbit of Pluto. The comet's orbit is retrograde, meaning it circles the Sun in the opposite direction to the planets, in other words, clockwise when viewed from above the Sun's north pole. 
Its retrograde orbit results in it having one of the highest velocities relative to the Earth of any object in the solar system, some 70.56 kilometres per second. That's an impressive 254,016 kilometres per hour. As well as the Eta Aquarids every May, Halley's Comet also produces the Orionids meteor shower in late October. Astronomers think Comet Halley was originally a long-period comet. It would have taken thousands of years to travel to the inner solar system from its home in the Oort cloud. But they think it was gravitationally perturbed into its current orbit as a result of a series of close encounters with the giant outer planets of the solar system. The Eta Aquarids meteor shower runs from the 19th of April through to the 28th of May, but it will peak around May 5th, with some 55 meteors an hour, making it one of the Southern Hemisphere's best celestial showers. Mind you, as impressive as 55 an hour sounds, back in 1975, the Eta Aquarids recorded a stunning 95 meteors an hour, and in 1980 it was up to 110 an hour. Just as impressive, the bright yellow meteors often appear as streaks known as trains. They'll radiate out from the direction of the constellation Aquarius and the star Eta Aquarii, hence the shower's name, Eta Aquarids. The best view of the Eta Aquarids will be towards the east just after midnight and before dawn. OK, let's turn to the stars now, and let's begin by looking towards the east, where we'll find the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. In Greek mythology, Scorpius was sent by the earth goddess Gaia to slay Orion the Hunter. After Orion had boasted that he was so talented, he could and would kill all the animals on Earth. Scorpius stung Orion in the shoulder. But Orion's life was spared by Ophesuchus, the healer, and placed in the heavens along with Scorpius, who would now pursue him for eternity. And so Orion the hunter had become the hunted forever, with Scorpius rising in the east this time of year to triumphantly chase and defeat Orion, who sets in the west. Meanwhile, the healer rises in the east, following behind Scorpius, to crush him back into the earth, and so the story plays out year after year. Interestingly, parts of the story predate the Greeks, with Orion known in ancient Egypt as Osiris, the Egyptian god of the underworld and of regeneration. As we look towards the constellation Scorpius, there's a bright star there which becomes very apparent. The star is Antares. Antares means the equal or rival of Mars, because the two look very similar as seen from the Earth. But while Mars is a small neighbouring terrestrial planet just a third the size of the Earth, Antares is a massive red supergiant, some 12.4 times the mass and at least 400 times the diameter of the Sun. Although Antares is located 550 light years away, it looks so bright because it's around 57,500 times as luminous as the Sun. But that's going to come to an end fairly soon. You see, Antares is destined to explode as a Type II or core collapse supernova sometime in the next few hundred thousand years, which in astronomical terms is any day now. When it does go supernova, from here on Earth it'll appear as bright as the full moon for several months. Antares has a companion star, a spectral Type B main sequence blue-white star known as Antares B, which can be observed through a decent-sized backyard telescope. The two stars orbit each other at an average distance of about 224 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. We don't know much about Antares b, however a spectral analysis of the star indicates it's pulling a lot of material off its bloated red supergiant companion. Located near Antares from our point of view and visible through a good set of binoculars is the M4 globular cluster. Globular clusters are densely packed tight spheres containing thousands to millions of stars, which were all originally formed at the same time from the collapse of the same molecular gas and dust cloud. The M4 globular cluster is located some 7,000 light years away, making it one of the nearest globular clusters to the Earth. Located near the tail of the Scorpion are two open star clusters, known as M6 and M7. Open star clusters are loosely bound groups of a few thousand stars, which, like their globular cluster counterparts, were originally formed at the same time from the same molecular gas and dust cloud. But they're not as densely bound as globular clusters. Open clusters generally survive for a few hundred million years, with the most massive ones occasionally surviving for a few billion years. In contrast, the more massive globular clusters exert a much stronger gravitational attraction on their members and can therefore survive for much longer, often as long as 12 billion years. M6, which is also known as the butterfly cluster, is some 12 light years across and located about 1600 light years away. In contrast, M7, or the Ptolemy cluster, named after the ancient Greek astronomer, 
is a much nearer 980 light years away and is also far more dispersed than M6, covering an area about 25 light years across. By the way, the term M, like in M4, M6 and M7, is an abbreviation for Messier in honour of the 18th century French astronomer Charles Messier, who developed an astronomical catalogue of fuzzy nebula-like objects in the skies. Messier was a comet hunter, so he compiled this list of 103 fuzzy objects which weren't comets, and so from his perspective, could be ignored. Later, other astronomers have added additional celestial objects to the list, bringing the present catalogue up to 110. Lying to the south this time of the year is the Southern Cross, which we covered in some detail last month. Now, near Beta Crucis, the left-hand side and second brightest star in the Southern Cross, is a spectacular young open star cluster, known as the Kappa Crucis Cluster, or NGC 4755, and more commonly called the Jewel Box, the name given to it by the famous 18th century astronomer John Herschel. As the name suggests, it's a stunning collection of more than 100 brightly coloured stars, located some 6,440 light years away. Although its exact distance is a bit difficult to determine because of the nearby Colsac Nebula, which obscures some of the light. The Colsac's a dark nebula, containing lots of gas and dust blocking out background stars. In Australian Aboriginal Dreamtime legend, the Colsac forms the head of the emu constellation, with the dark dust lanes of the Milky Way forming the emu's body and legs. The central parts of the jewel box are framed by bright stars making up an A-shaped asterism. These are among the brightest known blue, white and red supergiants in the Milky Way. OK, let's now turn to the planets. And Jupiter will continue to play a starring role for sky watchers during the evening this month. It'll be joined by the ringed world Saturn, rising just before midnight, and Luna, that's the name of the Earth's moon by the way in case you didn't know, will be dancing with Venus, Mercury and Mars throughout the month. On May 1st, Mars and Saturn will be at heliocentric opposition, meaning they'll be on directly opposite sides of the Sun from each other. As for the king of planets, Jupiter, it will be climbing high in the eastern sky earlier in the evening during May, compared to last month when sky watchers had to wait until around midnight for the planet to make an appearance. With a good pair of binoculars, the solar system's largest planet will look spectacular. And with a decent-sized telescope, you should be able to see the different coloured bands in its atmosphere and make out its great red spot. When we talk about Jupiter being the largest planet in the solar system, it's sometimes worth just thinking how big it really is compared to everything else other than the Sun. In fact, Jupiter could swallow up everything else in the solar system other than the Sun two and a half times over. Looking at Jupiter through a decent pair of binoculars, you should be able to spot the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And just like Galileo Galilei, you'll be able to watch them change their position every night as they orbit around Jupiter. Jupiter is easy to find because it'll be close to the moon on the evening skies of May the 5th through to the 8th. And later this month, you'll be able to use the moon again, this time to find Venus and Mercury in the eastern sky just before sunrise on May the 22nd and 23rd. On May the 5th, Mars will be at spring equinox. The full moon occurs on May 10th, while on May 12th the moon will be at apogee, its most distant orbital position from the Earth, when it will be at a distance of 63.69 Earth radii. Saturn will make her spectacular appearance before midnight in early May, rising about 11.30pm, and by 9.30pm later in the month. The best time to see Saturn will be when it's higher in the sky just after midnight towards the end of the month. Using a decent backyard telescope, you should be able to glimpse Saturn's cloud bands, and you may even see her northern polar regions, where a stunning hexagonally shaped storm has been raging for decades. And finally, on May the 26th, the Moon will be at perigee, its nearest orbital position to the Earth, when it will be just over 56 Earth radii away. And that's Skywatch on Space Time for the month of May. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 